right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second panel, Brexit and the International Media. Uh, I'm Stephanie. I'm the uh, uh, UK and Ireland correspondent for Die Welt. It's a German paper. I was supposedly one of the participants, but now I became chair. So <laughs> I was promoted. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to ask you guys a question, not being asked. Um, and I, um, we're going to do a couple of introductory remarks, a um, couple of questions, and then we are very keen to have you asking the questions rather than the panel talking to themselves. Um, so to my right is Mark Landler from the New York Times. Um, he's been a correspondent for 27 years, and many of those years, so 17 of those years, covering foreign affairs. You're the London Bureau Chief of the New York Times. Uh, then to my left, it's Rasmus Nielsen. He's uh, from, he's professor uh, at the, you're professor in Oxford and director of the Reuters Institute, yeah? yeah? Okay. And uh, Eric Albert from, uh, from France, not really from France anymore. He's got a British passport, <laughs> so he's safe. Um, <laughs> he works for Le Monde and Le Ton. Yep. And then uh, it's Jakob. Uh, until recently, Jakob worked for the Polish press agency uh, PAP. Is now freelancing, I think. That's and right, yeah. uh, I think it's really great to have someone also from the East, as they say, <laughs> because uh, unfortunately there are not many correspondents from Central or Eastern European countries. So Jakob is almost exotic in this place. <laughs> um, so could we go? Would you like to start? And then we do a couple of thoughts and start the discussion. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, and it's good to be here. I, I wanted to just say one or two things about my background um, by way of giving you some context. I have only been here for six weeks, so my uh, degree of expertise on Brexit is dubious, to say the least. Um, but I was in Washington for 11 years prior to this and for eight years covering the White House. Um, and I think that um, the the, the parallels between the Trump phenomenon in the U.S. and Brexit are, are obvious to everybody and uh, are probably one of the reasons that I was chosen to uh, come to London. Um, and so one of the things that I have been encouraged to do is to think of Brexit uh, in a way that uh, draws the parallels and differences between Britain and the United States as a way of making what would otherwise be an extremely complicated story more understandable to an American audience. Um, and I wanted to just point out one happy thing for, for me, and, and I think for, for Britain too, um, there are really only about three stories in the world that have genuine traction at my newspaper. The obvious one is Trump um, and the impeachment drama that we're now in the midst of. Um, the second one, I think, is the... Uh, the massive demonstrations in Hong Kong and, and, and how the Chinese may ultimately respond to that. Uh, and the third is the drama over Brexit. Um, it hasn't always commanded this kind of interest. There was a long stretch, I think, um, when Brexit fell off the radar screen a little bit. The nature of the negotiations between Britain and the EU were highly technical, um, and it coincided, obviously, with the uh, election of Trump in the United States, which simply blew everything else off the radar screen. But I think um, in the last couple of months in particular, uh, with uh, the arrival of Boris Johnson, who's such a flamboyant figure uh, and, and somewhat Trumpian, uh, and, uh, and with the kind of apparent crescendo of the story, um, there are lots of, uh, there's a great deal of interest uh, in the U.S. Um, and, 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 and as I said, it, it is a bit because the story is, for American journalists, a bit like holding up a mirror. Um, among the questions that have come up just in the five weeks that I've been covering this story in earnest uh, is uh, the role of the courts um, and the British Supreme Court, the ruling against the Johnson government, um, you know, suggested to some that the British Supreme Court, which had heretofore taken a very hands-off view and, and steered clear of political debates, whether it was moving more in a U.S. direction, whether it would get more involved in settling a political disputes, more involved in judicial review. 
I think that's um, by no means a settled question, but that made that courtroom ruling extremely interesting in the United States in a way that I don't think it would have been as much otherwise. Um, as I said, obviously, uh, Britain now has a prime minister who uh, is testing all kinds of conventions and rules, who's sometimes using language that sounds uh, eerily familiar to American ears, um, pushing the boundaries, um, using polarizing rhetoric, dividing people. Um, all of this is, is extremely uh, familiar to Americans and hence interesting to them. Um, and then finally, this bigger uh, question of, um, is this a country that's in the midst of a true constitutional crisis or merely a profound political crisis? Um, that's almost exactly the question that's being debated in the United States today. Um, so for all of those reasons, uh, I think Brexit is getting more interest in the United States than it has at any time, uh, and hopefully in a way that's, that's good for American readers to make sense of. Um, the only other point I wanted to address, because it came up as much in the US as it did here, was one of the questions raised in the previous panel, which was, um, did Brexit reveal a lack of understanding in the British media about its own, their own country? Um, that was obviously a burning question in the wake of the 2016 election in the US, um, insofar as almost all of us predicted that election wrong. Uh, and there was a great deal of criticism and, and soul searching about you know, whether we had not done enough of these regional safaris that Mira talked about earlier and didn't understand the nature of the Trump voter. Um, I always thought that criticism was slightly overdone. If you actually looked at our news columns in the months leading up to the 2016 election, uh, we went to the Rust Belt, to the upper Midwest, to Iowa, uh, over and over and over again. One of the problems uh, with the nature of political coverage is those sorts of stories uh, simply don't get sometimes the, the same prominent play that the good horse race story gets. Um, so we did a lot of that coverage. I think it just didn't get the kind of attention and exposure it probably should have. Um, the good news in the wake of the 2016 campaign is that we have devoted enormous resources uh, to going out into the field and talking to people. We now have a political staff of way over 20 people, reporters, not, not editors, just reporters, who will fan out across the country and, uh, and provide um, dozens and dozens of stories about the nature of the Trump voter. Does the Trump voter believe that Donald Trump delivered um, or not? Do they still have the same sense of grievance? And if so, is that grievance directed toward um, Trump himself or uh, toward the political establishment as it clearly was in 2016. Um, and, uh, and, and for my part, as a new correspondent in London, um, I'm excited by the prospect of a general election because there's no better excuse and occasion to go out and do that kind of reporting as a foreign correspondent than if you're covering an election. So um, we will, as foreign correspondents, we have fewer resources here, but we will do a lot of that kind of work uh, in Britain over the next uh, two months as that as this widely expected election plays out. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there and happy to take anything up in questions. Thank you. Over to you. Great. Uh, Mark, I'm really happy to hear that you're excited uh, about the prospect <laughs> of an election. I feel it's ever so slightly like sort of the Americans arriving in France in 1917. Um, and being initially quite excited. Uh, let's see how you feel uh, a couple of years from now. Um, At least elections are short in this country. Well, you know, there might be a few. Yeah. Um, I, I think really what I can do is to offer a little bit of a global perspective and also a few observations from our research uh, on how uh, international news audiences and, and how international news media have dealt with Brexit. And I think the first thing to say is just, I think we really need to remember um, that most people are not all that interested in Brexit. Uh, in this country, and certainly not globally. Um, and it's really, really, I think, important to recognize that we can live in a world at the same time where uh, news outlets like the New York Times and the FT, and for that matter, Velt and Le Monde, and the papers that Jakub writes for, um, can see their audience engaging very actively and very eagerly with this coverage, while the majority does not. Right. So the uh, New York Times has something like 4 million digital subscribers. The FT has something like a million. Uh, let's add another million from uh, Velt and Le Monde 
just for the sake of argument, we're still talking about less than one in a thousand people in the world, right, <laughs> that subscribe to these publications. I think we just really need to recognize uh, that these are very elite and very small in the grand scheme of things publications. And if you look around the world, I think we need to recognize that Brexit largely is a regional story uh, from the point of view of much of the world. No more and no less interesting or important than, say, the election in India or the elections in the Philippines or the new Ramaphosa government in South Africa. So I just looked through before this panel. Um, the most recent um, um, original story by Vidya Ram, the Hindu's correspondent in London on Brexit, is from May. Right. This is the Hindu, the, the, the paper of record uh, in India. They, they carry a lot of, of agency coverage of this. That's the last original story by video. The top result on the Philippines Inquirer on Brexit is from April. Deal or no deal, Brexit will not affect the Philippines. That's the headline. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear. Good for you. Uh, the top result on the Mail and Guardian in South Africa when you search for Brexit is from August. Is South Africa ready for Bojo's no deal Brexit? Question mark. One of the quotes, traders should not be worried. There you go. That's the global view, right? Last year, a team of our researchers looked at how things are covered across Europe. Uh, so they uh, analyzed uh, 4,500 articles uh, across a sample of 39 media outlets across eight European Union member states. Ireland is very different. Uh, so leave Ireland aside for a moment. In the other countries that we looked at, Basically, the top line is this. The majority of the coverage seems unconcerned about the UK leaving the European Union. Um, the majority of the coverage presents Brexit as more of a problem for the UK than for the European Union or its member states. Um, and it focuses uh, factually on the possible implications for the UK, not for the European Union or other member states. And it's primarily covered as a UK-EU issue, so as relations between Brussels and London, not as an issue that exists between member states and where the UK government can effectively engage with national politicians or governments across the continent. This is the way that the coverage is played out in Europe, uh, at least according uh, to our research. So I think we are in this moment where people like us in this room care deeply about this issue and, and I think see that it has potential to have much wider relevance that comes across in some of this coverage uh, and indeed much more profound and long-lasting effects and has some reminiscences with stories elsewhere, as Mark rightly said. But I think we really need to recognize uh, a lot of the world doesn't care and a lot of the public doesn't care uh, about this issue that we are all so interested in. Thank you. Eric. Right, so back into the bubble where, where people care about uh, Brexit. Um, the one thing for sure in Le Monde is there is a massive, massive interest for, for stories. Um, editors are very interested and ask for it. Uh, any story on Brexit got m plenty of clicks. Uh, yes, it is a bubble. Yes, um, it's also we are, you know, we love to hate the Brits or so we, we, we hate to love them, uh, whichever way. But, but, but so there is, of course, this direct effect, uh, plus, of course, a direct border. So it impacts um, a lot. But, Rarely a story um, in Britain has been has brought so much interest. Um, I also work for Le Temps, a Swiss paper. Um, the interest there is much smaller. Um, but they asked me a few weeks ago to write about you know, how is it to cover Brexit. Um, and I just, just did a quick calculation. I have, apparently, I've done 375 stories in the last three years on just on Brexit. So. So you know, this is the all-consuming issue all the time. Um, one thing to say about how readers interact on that. Um, during the referendum campaign, there used to be a strand of, I mean, most, most readers of Le Monde are pro-European. Le Monde is a pro-European uh, newspaper. It doesn't hide the fact uh, at all. Uh, but, and, but there was a strand of comments saying, you know what, we don't quite like the EU. Brexit is a good idea. Um, that was during the referendum campaign. Those comments have gone. And now the only comments left are, could we get rid of Britain as quick as possible? And what's happening to them? Why have they shot themselves in the foot? I mean, the, 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 there's between um, you know, puzzlement and just oh, we can't stand them anymore. So these are the reactions nowadays. Do those comments come from the LEC? Is it Macron? Who's <laughs> <to write? laughs> well, I mean, um, second thing I wanted to say, um, 
that's something that Michael Crick said earlier on, which is uh, only two people in the newsroom of Channel 4 um, voted Brexit. Um, I'm a EU member, uh, correspondent, living in London. Um, I'm naturally pro-European, and there's a real danger of living in this bubble. Um, I live in Lambeth, 75% remain uh, at the referendum. Um, and suddenly, as an observer of this country, I became also a player. On the day of the Brexit referendum, uh, I was very upset. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I decided to take the British citizenship because I've been here in, for 16 years. I just don't trust the Home Office. And, <laughs> and so when, when, when the three millions give a press conference, for instance, it's very hard not to directly relate to it. And th there's a real danger of living into that bubble that London bubble, but it's you know, pan-European, pro-European bubble. Um, and I see it from, from the editor. Whatever story I write that is criticizing Brexit for some reason because it's a chaos, or tend to be working better with them than any story that says, actually, um, maybe you know, um, there are some side to what the Brexiteers are saying. Uh, and so it's a real danger to, to, to really be careful of um, and the third thing I wanted to say is we live on an island, and this island does not engage with Europe, um, with foreign correspondent. Um, Stephanie, Jakub, and I are part of a European group that we put together to meet with, with MPs, with ministers, because this government and the previous government did not engage at all with foreign correspondent ever. Um, it has improved a lot in the last two years. Uh, but it took at least a year after the referendum to, to have some kind of interaction. Um, and it is very telling. So for um, a long time, we were receiving MPs or ministers for, for breakfast. And we saw them talking about the debate within Westminster between Brexiteers and Remainers, but not at all about, oh, by the way, what would the Europeans say to that? Mm -hmm. um, and there was this complete bubble effect, this island effect, um, that was really um, interesting to, to watch, and, and that explains a lot of what happened with, with Brexit. Um, so it has improved to an extent, but uh, it's still very hard to have some interaction with, with uh, authorities in this country. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Jakub. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm from Poland originally and covered the UK for the last four years for the Polish Press Agency. Uh, it's not meant to be a race, but I counted that before leaving the agency, and I did three and a half thousand stories <laughs> in the UK in that Yay. period of time. Uh, but that's mostly agencies of reports. They're qu short, I guess. Uh, but then but by the time I was leaving, I was told by my editors that apparently the only three people in the world that read it are my editors, the British Embassy, and the Polish British Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Um, so that probably tells you a lot about the interest in Poland. Um, I think the interesting thing about it is that when you think about what happened in the UK and in Poland over the last few years, in 2015, so during the renegotiation period, we had a new government in Poland, a nationalist, right-wing, conservative government taking over with majority, um, and then very quickly starting infringement law, EU law infringement procedures with the EU. Back then, it thought that the UK was a very stable democracy indeed. And just today, one of the most prominent UK journalists in Poland tweeted out something saying, I never thought I would say this, but watching Polish politics is now a form of relief from British politics <laughs> rather than the other way around. I think that tells you a lot about the journey that we've been on for the last few years. Um, for Poland, by far, the key two things are the exact opposites of what was the key thing for the Leave campaign in 2016, and that is the rights of Polish nationals in the UK and other EU nationals in the UK, over uh, 3.5 million EU nationals, of, of which about 1 million are the Polish people in the UK, and that's been by far the most important issue um, in the Brexit negotiations, particularly given the fact that this Sunday Poland goes, goes to polls, so we're going to have a general election in Poland, and the protection of rights of Polish nationals in the UK was a prominent part of the electoral campaign in Poland. It was not anything to do with Donald Tusk's handling of the negotiations, nor about the wider Brexit implications was specifically about that. Uh, there, was a, there was a widespread agreement about what needs to be done so that the Polish nationals in the UK are safe. Um, another thing I want to talk about a bit uh, was, the, um, was the, 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 the sort of misinformation about European perception or reactions to that. And um, some people here may, have, may, may recall the, um, a, a number of Leave MPs 
uh, who regularly come back with my favorite story of the Brexit campaign, which is that Poland can veto a Brexit extension or do something similar just because, I don't know what, maybe they, they just think that Poland hates you or whatever. That's not going to happen. And I think it's, it's something that keep, we, we, we have to keep saying, that so many things that the UK politicians talk about what Europe is going to do or is not going to do are absolutely not true. And my favorite part of that, when recently we had a meeting with a senior UK politician who was saying, like, oh, we've made great progress with Germany. And then one of our German colleagues was like, no, you didn't. And then he was like, oh, we've made great progress with France. Like, no, you did not. Uh, so so this, this incredible element of that, when they're trying to tell us things that we know are not true. And, and one of this, one of uh, something that Jill, I think, um, touched upon earlier was the uh, the Berlin call with Angela Merkel earlier this week. And uh, that's uh, sparked a big conversation between our, uh, our group as well. And we kind of thought that, you know, how you can talk about the call when you have a very stiff, a very well, single comment from a very involved person in this, this whole thing, talking about what they think happened during the call, when we kind of know 95% that is, this is just not true. And the UK media are going wild about it. And similarly today, the letter from Jeremy Hunt, uh, the EU foreign ministers, British media again going splashing on this basically and I, I messaged one of the Polish ministers earlier today who responded saying what letter? So I think that tells you a lot about the fact that a lot of Brexit debate in the UK is purely for domestic consumption and these are things that do not um, have any reaction or cause any reaction in our member states. Uh, so therefore it's sometimes perhaps a bit easier for us to cut through the noise instead of go to, for the things that actually matter in the Brexit negotiations, because in the relentless pursuit of breaking exclusives and booms and you know m m drop mic moments in the Brexit sort of debates within UK politics, I think we kind of try to focus on things that matter. Last one thing, I promise, about the engagement with uh, UK, with non UK journalists by the government. I think this is an incredible story because when you think about the elaborate institutions of the of the UK lobby and how it's been is organized and how it works. It's absolutely astonishing when you think about how unprepared the UK government is to engage with the European media on pretty much anything. They have no idea what European titles there are. They have literally no understanding what the profiles of certain newspapers are. And kind of sometimes the engagement is somewhat blind on this. So they kind of reach out to, to the wrong newspaper because they thought they had a different profile that they actually had, and so on and so on. So I think it's, it's been incredible to watch that. Because obviously UK's position, the way people perceive the UK always, was that, oh, surely they're going to know everything. They, they read this, they have this diplomatic presence everywhere. And it turns out, at the end of the day, about the, the non-UK media, they know absolutely nothing. Well, thank you very much for these very interesting introductions. Um, I, I think I would like to pick up two points and then give the questions back to you. And please do not feel like everybody has to answer, everybody in the panel has to answer the question, just if you feel to say something and then I think we should uh, open the, uh, the floor. Um, what uh, Jakub just said um, about the c quality uh, of the media or the coverage of Brexit by the UK media, and I, I, I'm very cautious how to say that because I'm, I've always been absolutely in, in awe of UK media. I mean, if you, I was a Brussels correspondent and when you were in the uh, briefing room in Brussels in the commission, you always thought, wow, the British media, they are really the mm -hmm. sharpest, they are having a go, they are well informed, they have read all the papers, they know how to ask. Um, I now often find myself almost shouting at the radio thinking, <laughs> why do you not ask about the substance? You just let them, you, you let them um, get away with it so often. I mean, so much of what the MPs say here, which is without any substance, is not questioned. And this also plays into uh, what Jakob and, and Eric just said about um, not having, I don't know, any interest or any drive to ask the other side what are they actually thinking. There is so little um, communication. Also, there was so little communication with us. It uh, was almost like, are we doing you a favor that we talk with, with you at all from Dexu or, or even number 10? Um, so that is something that um, without, I, I, I just don't say that with any arrogance. I don't say the European media is better or whatever, but I'm, sometimes I find it jaw dropping. Also the story of Merkel, I mean, obviously because it's my country, I tried to find out a little bit about the call. It was impossible to find out. They wouldn't say anything, but the idea that you just report on this call without 
any proof and then say, well, they are not, uh, they are, the Germans are not uh, commenting on it because it's true. Wow. Um, this is, um, I think, I mean, that's another chapter you could actually really write about. Um, and then something I picked up from, uh, from, from you, Mark, which I also thought was very interesting. It's, we said um, it's holding up a mirror, what's Brexit, in terms of um, Trump and Boris, the arrival of Boris Johnson. And I think it's kind of a perfect storm because it is so easy to compare Trump and Johnson. And I do think, now playing it back to the role and the responsibility of the European media, we have to be very cautious about how we cover Brexit. And I, I mean, I don't want to sound now somehow pathetic, but we have a responsibility here. And I think already, when I talk to friends and family back in, in Germany, and I'm sure you will have the same, the image of the UK is now rather bad in Europe. Mm. And I think we need to be really careful about how we cover this, because it's so easy to do the the, the balloon they had, uh, which was like the Trump baby and the Boris baby. And it's because we, we still have to live with each other afterwards. And we actually don't want this to become worse. But it's very easy to, to get into that. So please. I, I mean, just on that last point, I, I agree that we need to be careful. And one of the things that I have tried to do early on is to also point out the differences. I mean, for one thing, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump are really fundamentally quite different despite the surface similarities. Um, I mean, Trump is a, is a sort of a, you know, barely literate businessman from the outer boroughs of New York City, socially insecure, you know, with endless, fathomless reserves of narcissism. Boris Johnson is much more of an establishment figure. He's, he's extremely well read. He's not nearly, I think, as confrontational at heart as Donald Trump is, who thrives on fighting with people all the time. He's litigious. Um, I, I don't see Boris uh, Johnson really as that kind of character. So um, I agree that we've got to be very careful and show a little nuance. Um, I also don't, frankly, see anything yet in the British experience that strikes me as profound a threat to the constitutional order as, <clears throat> as what Donald Trump has done, particularly in the last few months in the United States. Um, speaking of phone calls and, and wondering what gets said on phone calls with foreign leaders, I mean, we can't even contemplate what has maybe been said in certain phone calls between Trump and a foreign leader. Um, so I agree with that. And then just one final uh, point uh, to make on this issue of access and how um, governments treat the foreign press. Um, and here I just want to say uh, one thing that always struck me as a White House correspondent was that I had these very fine colleagues from, you know, Die Welt and, and Le Monde and, and uh, the Turkish newspapers and, and all over the world, and they got no access. I mean, no one would talk to them. And when I say no one, I mean the lowest level person in the communications office would have no time for the most important paper in a foreign country. So I am completely sympathetic to this. I might be in a marginally better position because I'm an American correspondent at a time when the UK probably feels like it needs the United States. Um, but I'm probably going to get to taste a bit of what I always saw myself when I was in the other position. Uh, and it'll probably be a bit sobering. And so I, I agree that that's a major problem for uh, a lack of understanding and the quality of the coverage because you, when you have no access, you only have two choices. You can, uh, you can sort of um, default to the local media, which in this case is the British press with, with all of the issues that entails, um, or, or you can just sort of write a less informed version and take a lot of hunches and speculation, and that's a very bad way to cover any major and important story. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, more from an academic perspective, because we had a long discussion also about the call and how we should actually accept the leaks, how we should report on the leaks, how leaks are reported, for example, the Spectator uh, blog uh, about probably Dominic Cummings sending texts to, what's his name, James Forsyth. So wh what is the, I mean, how could you improve that? Because it, it, it doesn't help to have a informed and independent coverage? Um, as any of you who have spent five minutes with academics will know, we are piss poor at solutions and great at documenting and diagnosing <laughs> problems. Um, 
I don't know is the honest truth. I mean, I think, uh, Jacob, I think you put it extremely precisely and forcefully. Um, look, you know, um, in terms of understanding the European dimension of the Brexit issue, the British press is being played by an instrument, and it doesn't seem to care. I mean, I think that's the honest truth of it. Uh, it's very hard for me to accept that, that British journalists don't understand what's going on. Of course they do. Uh, they if they thought about it for five minutes, which they have. They're very smart, hardworking people who care about this. Uh, but uh, here we are, right? I mean, this pattern you described has been going on for a long time. And you can have the other example is the Boris Johnson proposal to Brussels, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can almost imagine the sort of Churchillian, sort of Churchillian response from Brussels. This is not a plan. This is not even the beginning of a non-paper. It may yet be the beginning of a non-paper, right? I mean, there is nothing there. There is no proposal that would be recognized as such from Brussels' point of view. And yet, the coverage here is as if uh, there was no, uh, no one at the other end. Of course, this is not a new problem. Um, and, and one example that Mark will be familiar from the United States that involves Le Monde is that, you know, in the run-up to the Vietnam War, the Tonkin Bay incident, which was reported by the New York Times as a fact, <coughs> on the basis of sources in the White House, Le Monde wrote in French, they had sources in Vietnam, um, illustrating, shall we say, the more, rather more complex reality on the ground. Apparently, no one in the New York Times took notice of this. So it's not a new problem, I think. I mean, it, it seems to me that one of the options would, here would be for British uh, news organizations to at least think about whether occasionally they might want to commission pieces from people from the continent, uh, some of whom already work uh, here and may have uh, the ability, if they've written four and a half thousand stories already, maybe write one more just for a, a UK audience rather than, uh, than for a Polish audience in this case. Do you want to share any more thoughts on that? I mean, or very, shall we open? <coughs> very briefly, if I can. Yeah. Now, I just wanted about, about getting the tone right. I think the, that was something that we saw from the very start of the negotiations. So when you recall the, I think it was Lancaster speech, um, Lancaster House speech, when the then Prime Minister said something about defense cooperation, security cooperation, which was widely seen in Europe as a threat and sort of as, a, as an attempt at blackmailing. And, and when we talk to people in Downing Street, they're genuinely shocked by the fact that we read that. And that was a, a, all of us, literally all of us EU correspondents read that as, a, as an attempt to blackmail EU into, into some sort of deal by saying we're, gonna ref we're not going to work with you on security and defense cooperation because if you don't play the ball on, on other stuff. And yet, Darling, she was absolutely shocked by that. So there's, I think there's a, there's a thing about getting the tone right and stuff, understanding the audience that the, the European um, listeners, diplomats, they'll see everything in a different light because they will not see it in the light of tomorrow's Telegraph paper, front page or tomorrow's uh, Daily Mail front page. They look at it from their own interest. And that, that's sometimes very, very different. Just one thing to come back on the asymmetry of uh, information, the fact that we, are, we have been struggling, although it has improved, to, to get access. Um, I'm sure in the White House it's the same for foreign correspondent. I'm not very surprised. Uh, I know that in Brussels, um, every foreign journalist, by definition, uh, have pretty much the same access and, and the British journalists have. In the Elysee Palace, um, British journalists are accredited and have a regular access to, to briefings. I think in Germany it's the same as well. So um, there is some kind of asymmetry in the sense that there is more access given in Europe to, to, to British journalists. J just one observation on that. I mean, I, I just wanted to pick up on what Stephanie said, which I think is a, quite an important sort of personal side of this, is that we all want to live together also in the future, even if we've had these various bust ups, both domestically and across the region, if you will. But I suppose if I can speak in a personal capacity as a continental European with sort of a mild case um, of Anglophilia, in some ways you can come here from the continent and think, you know, the continent is the world that's populated by nationalist romantics and ideologues, right? Um, and then you look at the UK, and I think there is a certain kind of European, and I suppose I've counted myself uh, amongst them, who thought of the UK as a country that was sort of more cosmopolitan, uh, more mercantile, and more pragmatic. Um, and I suppose, if nothing else, the whole Brexit story has just demonstrated beyond doubt to me how European, how fundamentally European <laughs> this country too is. It too is populated with people I can recognize instantly from the continent, nationalists, romantics, and ideologues. And I love all of you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So yeah, I would very much like to uh, open the floor and ideally take three questions. And yeah, the lady here at the top. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I was very interested in some of your comments about the fact that uh, there was a little bit of an unconcern from the European reader in a way that they feel is more EU-UK discussion, that it is a member state UK impact. I wanted to know in France and in Poland in particularly if there was a lot of report on the impact on the particular French-UK relationship or Polish-UK relationship in terms of the economic impact. So really more in terms of the I would say the, the negative effect of Brexit on this particular member state. And if yes, was there a big appetite from the reader from that, or it was uh, more seen as a very long distant EU-UK more than specific uh, member state UK relationship? Because uh, coming from the chemical industry, we could see that sometimes the, the chemical industry in Europe is not prepared as much as Brexit consequences mm -hmm. in the UK. So I wanted to know what is the normal reader think about that and how as a press you've been educating the reader about the impact on their national member state. Okay. Um, yes, and if you, if you don't mind um, introducing yourself briefly. Uh, yeah, my name is Tim Bale. I'm Deputy Director of UK and Changing Europe. Um, I just wondered if there were any interesting and or significant differences between the articles that you would like to write or you pitch to your editors and the articles that your editors ask you to write. Okay, um, third one, maybe here in the front. Um, Jen Stout, uh, BBC. Um, Stephanie, you were talking about the, like the, the codependency, I think, between the, um, the, the press and the government here and really highlighted in the last few weeks with the, the way that we're reporting on, on leaks and so on. And, and it really, I'm, I'm about to move to Germany and I'm really interested in um, getting that fresh perspective of kind of what the hell is going on here, you know? And so from your, you know, your, your perspectives as, as uh, foreign correspondents, is it, is it worse here? Is there something gone particularly wrong in the, in, in the British media in this, in this city? Or is this a, you know, a problem that's being replicated all over the place and it's just more visible here because of Brexit? Uh. Would you want to start with a Polish-French question, maybe? <laughs> so, no, about the... Uh, I'm not sure I got it right. It was, it was about the other than political impact on Polish-British uh, relations. Um, I mean, there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot of debate about the security cooperation, so if the fact that we have UK troops on the ground in Poland. So there's been some interest in this. However, that was clearly overshadowed immediately by the US deployment to Poland which is now seen as the most important, despite the fact that we have UK troops in Poland. Um, I've done a lot of stories about trade, and particularly there's, a, there's an element there about transport with so many Polish companies, with lorry drivers, even within the UK operating um, in terms of um, transporting the cabotage, the so-called cabotage thing. Um, but the interest in that is minimal. And also what, I'm, what I noticed is that very often the um, professional sort of slash industry trade bodies in Poland would delegate that to the government and they would expect the Polish government to deal with that, which is a optimistic assumption. Uh, but, uh, but, but I've seen that there's, there's um, clearly the 95% the, 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 the of interest in the stories on citizens and the citizens' rights and everything that relates to that because obviously a lot of trade and transport and so on relates to that as well, so sort of servicing the Polish community in the UK, because, because when you have 905 million people, that's a big industry in itself. I think you're right. Um, for a while, it looked like Brexit was a British issue, British matter, and with no clear direct consequences for the EU. Uh, I think we have clearly, um, and for a while, we didn't write that much about the economic impact on Europe. I think we have redressed the balance for quite a long time now. Uh, you know, it's been going for three years and three months, so we have had time to redress any balance. Um, so I think it, the message has finally came across. Um, there's been numerous reports on, on the Calais port, for instance, of what would be the impact in the north of France, because there's a direct, uh, clear impact. Uh, but it took a while. It took a while to, to, to get down to, to, to um, the view that, yes, it has an impact both sides. Um, and it relates, in a way, to the second question um, about you know, what would I like to write and what would my editors like to write. Um, I never, ever have um, a proposal for me that is rejected. You know, so, so whatever I want to write is, is, is accepted most of the time. But what is asked from the editor tends to be very negative. I mean, partially because media writes about trends who don't arrive on time. And that's true about Brexit as well. So 
that, that's a natural bias of media, but, but I have written a couple of pieces not long ago on, on the British economy trying to say that, yes, it has slowed down, yes, it has had the negative impact, but at the end, it hasn't quite collapsed. And I felt the need to redress a little bit the perception in, in France that actually Britain mostly was still minding its own business. You know, daily people in their daily life were just keeping going and they were still not quite going hungry and asking for coupons to buy food. I mean, yeah, because really there, there was this perception that it was really, really negative. So I felt the need to redress this balance a little bit. Um, and that's linked to what I was saying earlier on about, you know, being a European, naturally, the bias is to write something negative, plus it's hard to argue that it's going well, frankly. Um, so, so it is natural to, 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 to blacken, to, da to darken the, the picture, but I think we have to be careful about that. Well, do you want to say something about the you only arrive? Uh, can you pitch whatever, or do, does the Times often tell you what they would like to read? Um, I mean, <clears throat> again, I'm, I have pitched not, not only not 3,500 stories, I'm probably up to about 10 um, <clears throat> on this subject. So um, the good news about being a foreign correspondent for our paper is, for the most part, um, you can pitch whatever you want, and the editors don't get that involved in telling you how to cover things. And that's a refreshing change from my last job, because covering the White House, you had almost the reverse problem. Everyone. Uh, among senior editors is a sort of an amateur White House correspondent, and you spent most of your time knocking down story ideas that made no sense or were uninformed or <laughs> conventional wisdom. Uh, and <clears throat> that was a lot of the job, the internal argument, <clears throat> sorry, over how to cover the White House. It won't be that way in this job. Um, we are more on the ground in in, uh, in London than we are almost anywhere else because it's one of our three major production hubs along with New York and Hong Kong. So there is, in fact, uh, a group of editors who sit in London and work in London and bring some of their own ideas to the story. But in my brief exposure and time there, it's become clear to me that you still fun function more like a traditional foreign correspondent. And um, and so that's a, that's a refreshing thing. And, and you know, we'll see the proof of that over the next few weeks. I, I did say I was looking forward to the election. Um, and it'll be fun to see whether I can cover the election the way I covered an election in the United States, which is what I'd like to do. So that'll be the test. Yeah. Uh, the, the question about Germany. Um, well, first of all, very very good for you going to Berlin. I think it's it's really exciting to be in Berlin now um, because the, the country is changing rapidly, and uh, actually also because of Brexit, Germany will will take naturally a different role in Europe. Um, what you will experience, I think, um, being used to the British media, you will find the German media quite dull in the sense that they are by far not so aggressive. Um, there is not this competition, especially when it comes to the Sunday papers. I mean, I, I know that here press offices from Saturday lunchtime, they, they have sweat on their forehead because they are fearing what's going to be in the next day's Sunday paper. Um, so it's, it's, it's not so fierce, um, certainly not. Um, I, again, as I said, uh, I always thought that the British media is much better in the sense of being quick and aggressive and to the point as much as the American media. Um, but now I often think, and I think you agree, they just get carried away mm -hmm. with another leak or another, another non-paper, which basically has no substance. And you th sometimes think, just stop. Take a, take, a, take a step away and look at the whole picture. There's absolutely nothing. And, and that's why it's, uh, it feels a bit like constant hot air circle, well, if you wake up the next morning, you are, you are where you were the last day. More questions, Jill. Hi, um, I just wondered if you might comment on the extent to which you've um, been able to report and really understand the mindset of people who think Brexit is a good thing, and particularly in Northern Ireland, to understand the point of view of the unionists who have real reservations about the EU's, you know, genuine reservations about the EU's proposals. And if you might contrast 
the way in which you've interacted with the Irish Embassy, the Government of Ireland, in their sort of quite uh, quite effective diplomatic offensive to make sure everybody understands their side of the story with understanding the other side, because clearly it's quite a big theme for Europe as a, putting itself as a defender of the Good Friday Agreement. I just wondered how you were reflecting on that. More questions? I think you wanted to ask a question, yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, Lisa Bongoroth from Imperial College London. Um, I was wondering, uh, I wanted to pick up on what you said about the how we're going to work together after all of this is over, if it ever is over. But if, if we had a no deal and what you said about the perception of the UK on mainland Europe already, um, I was wondering how you are currently thinking about reporting on that, given you said that you perceive yourself to have a responsibility, and what sectors like ours can do to help with that. So we perceive ourselves to be European university, European partnerships are incredibly important for science, and we are obviously quite worried about the impact that a no-deal can have on, on the perception of UK researchers and, and UK people, as opposed to in the wider sense. I would like to, well, do we have a third question, maybe? Mm, no. For the time being, who would like to answer the question on how much you try to explain or cover the Brexiteers' perspective and Northern Irish perspective on, on Brexit? There is a danger, I think, um, a little bit maybe like covering Trump. When you cover the Brexiteers, it's always uh, somebody mentioned the safaris uh, earlier on. I can't remember, maybe it was you. Um, and there is some truth in that. Um, the danger is you, you send someone to the <coughs> poor part of um, of, Brit of Britain or England, really, um, and try to understand. And, and then the, then the piece is quite sympathetic, saying, "Oh yes, they, they voted stupidly, but of course they are poor, and therefore you, you, can, you can understand them." I mean, that, that, of course, it's a caricature. It's, we are trying to be a bit more subtle than that. But there is this real danger um, about not quite understanding that. Actually, there is, the Brexiteers are much more diverse than that. On Northern Ireland, um, the unionist side, I mean, it's so hard to get your head around why are unionists pro-Brexit? Uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to make sense. Um, my colleague, not, not me, did, did pieces on that. Um, but, but that's true. Um, it's difficult to bring that across. Um, the access to the Irish authorities is incredibly easy. Getting any briefing with the Irish uh, government is super simple and fast, and they are direct and efficient. As I mentioned several times, the, the Brits, uh, good luck. Uh, the, Northern, the, the DUP doesn't speak much. Uh, I remember asking an interview with the DUP, not going anywhere. Um, so so you, you have this imbalance. Uh, I think that's correct. And it's, plus, I mean, Trying to explain Northern Ireland to any London-based reader or any European reader is already a nightmare. It's incredibly complicated in Northern Ireland. Putting Brexit on top of that is really, really difficult. Um, so yes, it's a challenge. So very quickly on, on Brexit, I think it's um, so the Polish government is Eurosceptic, <laughs> and there's a lot of similar tones in what they talk about. And that's one of the reasons, but coming back to an earlier question, why Poland was so unhappy to see UK leave, because it always considered the UK, and particularly conserv conservative-run UK, <coughs> as a natural ally in reforming the EU and changing the union in a way they would like to it, be a sort of the Europe of nations and not a kind of more integrated institution. So I think in, in that sense, I'll, I have a lot of time for Brexit and the arguments, because a lot of these debates are present in Poland. Now, obviously, it, it's enough for you to look at the map of Europe to know that why Poland will never vote to leave the European Union, uh, being just next to a big country that has slightly aggressive reactions to things happening elsewhere. But, um, but there are a lot of views like that in Poland. So uh, in a way, writing about what Brexit they think about the EU and how they see, what, what kind of problems they see with the EU, you kind of answer a lot of discussions that are that taking place in Poland anyway. And I think in that sense, that is really interesting as well, because particularly in the last few years, there's been this talk, there's been this speculation about pole exit, as they call it, so the Polish exit from the European Union. And through <coughs> covering Brexit, we kind of have a discussion about that as well. I remember meeting with a senior Polish minister just after the referendum in 2016, who said that if they can do it, then maybe we can do it as well. 
now I think he after after a few years later I think he, he's not that optimistic anymore um, about this and also Poland for a second just to come back to that Poland seen itself uh, for the first year year and a half after Brexit as if bad boys duo with the UK so with Poland having the sort of EU law infringement procedures against it every other week and the in the UK being very you know negotiating Brexit we, we thought that this is a strategic alliance but then you can see that over the last year, Polish governments have realigned itself and decided that it's actually better to stick to the European Union's line on this. Um, and on the DUP, I think we've been trying to get the DUP to talk to us for the last three and a half years, and we met with them once, uh, despite like hundreds, if not more, of requests to, to talk to them, which also again tells you, because I do ac accept and appreciate that their point of view is very important and probably underreported, but again, that's a matter of, that, that is just so difficult to get to talk to anyone as opposed to the Irish government, for example. Um, Jill, the question about Ireland, I think that's a really interesting one. And if, uh, if the Reuters Institute one day would maybe write a story about how to, do, um, how to get good coverage um, of your politics, a, a bad case and a good case, very smart, the Irish, and I think the British government has not really helped itself to have a good <coughs> coverage outside the UK. The Irish have been incredibly smart. They have been always very helpful, always very welcoming. They have organized incredibly good trips uh, from the um, commission and the, the um, uh, Irish represent representations in Brussels. They, they did these trips to Dublin and from Dublin to the border. And you met real people. As we know, as journalists, we really need real people. And this was always very good real people. They, were, <laughs> they, were, they had uh, milk uh, production or, uh, for example, um, when I went on this trip, we went to a, a cancer uh, clinic in near Derry, and where you had people from Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic coming. And of course, the perfect quote is, well, in the old days, uh, I had to travel to Galway, and it took me three days, and now I can go here in half an hour, and what if there's a border? So, I mean, and, and the, I think the Irish government, the Irish Foreign Office was very, very good at, at facilitating that. And, and of course, as European media, you do not think that actually Brexit is brilliant for the European Union and how difficult it will be for Ireland. That was then a very, say, easy story to do. Um, in terms of the um, blame game, I think this is what we are facing now. This is, um, it's not about a deal anymore. It's all about the narrative. Um, and actually, only last night, I asked a German politician about this. And I, I asked him the question, look, the British government is saying you have to cho a choice to make. You either agree to our customs centers away from the border and you have some infrastructure, or you don't agree and you have no deal. And that's a, that's a proper hard border. And I asked that German politician, so do you take the responsibility to cause no deal because you didn't agree to the Brits and there's the first car bomb and two children are killed? because you were too intransigent as Europeans to agree to the Brits. I didn't really get an answer to that, but it, it, what the Irish say, what the Germans would say, is it was never our choice. So, and I think this is, a, this is not a very good basis for the future to live together, okay. but there we are. Can I just add? Yeah. Just adding one thing on, on Northern Ireland or Scotland. I mean, I've been in this country a long time, so I remember a life before Brexit, and going covering Northern Ireland, covering the St. Andrews Agreement a long time ago, I realized how much Northern Ireland stories are reported in, in London as a foreign story. Um, Scotland, almost the same. Um, it's incredible how little there is about Northern Ireland, and, and therefore, um, that's probably why during the Brexit campaign, nothing was talked about, uh, or very little was talked about. Uh, on, on, on Ireland, it's, it's, th there is really a very strange thing because now, for political reason, the border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland cannot happen, but of course, the truth is in many people's mind here, it is already a foreign country. And don't say that to the Northern Irish Unionists, of course, but it is, it is the case. Um, if you want to know what's happening in Northern Ireland, read the Irish papers, not the British ones. More questions, Mark. I'm Mark English, I work for the European Parliament and I want to work for the Commission here. Um, I could make all kinds of speeches, but I'm going to ask a very factual question. You talked about your relationships with, or lack of it, with British government people. You talked about the contrast with uh, what it's like in other countries. 
I'd like to ask about your relations with British journalists, in particular the lobby, and in particular the members of the lobby who work for the tabloid press. Do you have interaction with them? Do you socialise with them? Do you feel that you have a, any kind of uh, common interest or common perceptions with them, or is it another world to you? More questions? I'd like to, to, to build on that topic. Um, um, it, um, coming back to the Merkel phone call, uh, don't you think that uh, it's, it's amazing that in this modern world where everything is, seems to be a network, we still have these info silos in between, between countries, so that something happens in Germany, between Germany and the UK, and it's reported differently in both countries, so shouldn't there be a way to, to engage with each other more so you can check stories with each other? And also for the UK journalists, get in touch with the foreign con correspondents core more frequently because that's usually useful information. Thank you. I think there was one question here. Uh, hello, I'm Kay from um, I'm Reuters Institute fellow. I used to I work for a Japanese public broadcaster NHK. I was a foreign correspondent correspond myself in Jerusalem. I want to ask you a question of when you guys report to your home country about such a complicated issue like Brexit, like every single details, it probably the people in your home country would not understand these single detail steps that happens every day. And or it doesn't maybe really matter. How, how do you, what are the things that you keep in mind so that people in your home country would understand the whole picture of the Brexit. I mean, the news coming from NHK office in London, there's so much detail, and probably like 90% of Japanese people wouldn't understand what they're talking about. You know, so what are the things that you you guys are doing to to make it easier to understand? And I want to ask you also that the, what are the other news that you're covering other than Brexit. The Brexit <laughs> is so big that all the news coming from London office of NHK is about Brexit. And if they do propose something else, uh, the Tokyo wouldn't accept it because you know they are so occupied with the Brexit, and you know they would feel so odd to listening to any stories from UK without mentioning Brexit. So that's my question. But do you want to start? Have you written anything that was not Brexit? Well, I mean, this may or may not make the Brits in the audience feel better, but we've had major stories on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and his loss. <laughs> <laughs> and, we had, and we had a significant story on Colleen Rooney and the whole Instagram <laughs> in today's paper. So um, Britain's well represented. Um, and, 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 and in our paper, it, it does sort of break down a little bit that way. I mean, Brexit is the, the, the serious story, but then there's a whole range of hardy perennial stories that will always be popular uh, in an American newspaper about Britain that have to do with the royal family and, and you know, mis misbehaving football stars and that kind of stuff and their spouses. Um, but um, a as I said, I'm new here, and so I can't really give you the benefit of my experience except to say that um, previous London correspondents who've done this job well have written about a whole range of topics. And, you know, one of the nice things about living in London is um, it's a world capital where the most brilliant and interesting and important people in the world pass through. And if you can't find a steady diet of fascinating things to write about in science, humanities, um, human rights, anything like that, then you're just not doing your job. So my hope is that over time, if I look back on my time, if all my stories were about Brexit, then I didn't do my job properly. And I hope that won't be the case. Um, uh, I also don't want to write 25 stories about Colleen Rooney, but if I have to write one or two, I'll happily do that as well. I mean, maybe just quickly on this, I think the one way to think about this is um, the quip that was made by the then Danish foreign minister uh, in the earlier stages of this long saga, that there are really only two kinds of countries in Europe. There are small countries who know that there are small countries, and then there are small countries that don't know that there are small countries. <laughs> um, and in some ways, it seems to me that what Britain is at the receiving end of now in terms of international media coverage is something that happens to countries all over the world all the time. 
which is that they're largely read through the lens of a single story. Right? Mm -hmm. When is the last time any of you read anything about Brazil that wasn't about Bolsonaro? When is the last time you read anything about India that wasn't about Modi and or Kashmir? Uh, when is the last time you read something about China that wasn't about Xi Jinping and, and his approach to governing uh, that country? So in that sense, right now the UK is being reduced to a single story read through a single lens uh, in a lot of organizations around uh, the world the same way that our own uh, media all too often reduces countries everywhere else to a single story read through a single lens. Do you maybe want to say something about the contact with the lobby and other... Well, that's going to be short. Okay. <laughs> My contact with the lobby, none. Zero. Uh, it's a great regret. Uh, after 16 years here, basically, I don't know British journalists. Um, I don't know if it's my failure or what, but that's, that's a fact. Um, <coughs> silos, yes, you're right. We are completely living in information silo. Uh, one thing about this country is they speak English um, and not many other languages. <laughs> Therefore, you know, the whole of Europe reads British papers or the BBC or whatever. Pretty much no one here reads what's happening in Le Monde mm -hmm. or in Die Welt or in the Polish news agency because they don't speak the language. I, I don't blame anyone. You know, it, it so happened that this is the lingua franca of the world, but it's a massive asymmetric uh, <coughs> re access to information, and I have absolutely no solution to that. Um, I think. You do a lot of uh, English reporting as well, so that's maybe one, one idea. I mean, some of the content of European papers being translated in English. Um, and any other news on Brexit? I wish. Uh, I, I try every now and then when it gets a bit quieter to get away from Brexit. Um, I, I do some sports story from time to time. I, I went um, a while ago now doing something on, on life expectancy going down, which I felt was extremely relevant and interesting, and not mentioning Brexit once. Um, but it's hard, because the problem with Brexit is it gets everywhere. So you're right about finance, Brexit comes up. You're right about chemical, the chemical industry, Brexit comes up. And so it's not the major issue for most people, but it is in every people's life, everywhere. And so it's very hard to get away from it. Um, again, I have absolutely no solution, <laughs> except trying as much as I can, when I can, not to write about Brexit. But you know, right now, how would you write about something else? I mean, you know, look at how it's dominating everything that really matters. So on the lobby, um, I don't know how many of us on the panel, but did, did you apply for the lobby pass? I'm in the process. It's yeah, very the, difficult. Well, yeah, so we're both in the process. I've been in the process for like two years now. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's apparently a long process. And, you quite, and, and I think Sonia is as well in the process for like forever. Uh, so that, I guess, kind of answers your question a bit. So even if we want to engage with the lobby and we kind of try to get the pass and kind of want to join the, or the briefing or the uh, senior number 10 sources say things, uh, it's kind of difficult to get even to that point because when you apply, when you file the application, when, when you kind of have to list all the people you've ever met in the UK because of security reasons, it, it, it still gets stuck somewhere. And I keep following with them like every two or three months. I get no answers usually. So it's kind of, that's it. I've been, I have contacts with a couple of lobby correspondents, but that's still very, very limited. And that's something that comes up as well talking about the silos. But when you, whenever you have a European press review, my favorite thing is when it comes down, comes down basically to like a French newspaper, a Spanish newspaper, a German newspaper, and that said Europe has ended, that's it. There's no more press in Europe. Uh, and, and it's obviously down to language competences and the fact that you probably would struggle to find people in these newspapers who speak other languages. But that also gives you a very specific view about how Europe perceives Brexit, because obviously there are more views than that. And there will be countries that have a very specific point of view on other things like, for example, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and the mig migrants issue uh, has not been covered extensively in the UK. Now, talking <coughs> about explaining Brexit, I think that's something that Jill mentioned earlier. Uh, so I very early on sort of decided to do a lot of explainers and sort of stories that kind of break it down for people so they can easily understand what was the process, how, what's happened, and what, what are the next steps, what's going on. So it's kind of easier for them to catch up at any point. It's kind of like a recap at the end of second series that you kind of do for <laughs> someone who's, who's sort of joining the, joining the party a bit late, so they know what's going on. But uh, that was by far, I think, the easiest way to do it because you're right. 
normally when we write a story, then it's kind of difficult to have enough space to basically, and in the last episodes, and then you go uh, for a very long list. But about other non-Brexit issues, I think I'm, I'm lucky enough to have this massive Polish community in the UK. Uh, and through that, I can report on, another, on a lot of different stories, particularly now when we focus on um, how many of these people consider going back to Poland for whatever reasons. And obviously on that point, we kind of try to compare both countries and sort of look at how both countries react to certain things like the gender pay gap, minimum wage, um, wealth, wealth and health inequality. But one, one example that was really struck, struck me the other day, when you look at the borough of Camden in London, and when you go to the further north point of the borough and the further south point of the borough, the life expectancy changed by 20 years in one borough in central London. Um, so when you think about it, that, that you'd not find a place in Poland where the same thing happens. And it's interesting to look into how states sort of react to that, how, how it tries to address that. So, so through the Polish angle, I can go back and sort of look how UK does a lot of internal things. And yeah, that's it for me. I think we are running out of time. Yeah, um, very German. It's quarter to 12. Finish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel, and thank I you. hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Well done.